time is here. Welcome. Let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of today. Thank you for all of the many blessings you have given us. Lord, in a particular way, today on this Sunday, the day your son rose from the grave to save us, Lord, we thank you for the gift of his resurrection, the gift of his grace. We ask, Lord, that you may fill our hearts, fill our minds, so that we may see you and know you more deeply. We ask this through the intercession of our Blessed Virgin Mother Mary, through the intercession of St. Michael, the Archangel, our patron saint, through the intercession of Joseph, our spiritual father, and of all the angels and saints. We ask this through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Well, welcome to Catholicism 101. First, I have to disclaimer, my voice is a little raw right now, so please forgive me if I get um, a little choked up in emotion. No, um, <clears throat> so please forgive me if it sounds a little hard to hear. My voice is normally very beautiful and very easy to hear, so <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, <clears throat> all right, so Catholicism 101, just a real quick introduction. Father Farmer and I had this idea um, last semester. It's something I've been brainstorming for my entire priesthood, and it's something, too, a lot of people go through RCIA programs throughout, you know, throughout the country, throughout the world. A lot of people are coming into the Catholic faith. And the cool thing about the RCIA program is that you get basically a one year, nine month-ish, kind of walk through everything you need to know about the Catholic faith. If you want to join us, let's make sure you know everything you got to know. And the blessing of RCIA is that you don't, you know, no one comes into this faith alone, but you have a sponsor. You have someone who's inspired you, someone who's introduced the gospel to you. And so oftentimes we'll have Catholics come to the RCIA classes. And they'll sit in with the person they're sponsoring. And many times they'll raise their hand or they'll come up after and be like, Father, I never knew that. I've been Catholic my whole life and I just, I never knew that. And so that happens a lot. And so a lot more Catholics were like, well, can I come to RCIA, you know, so I can learn about the faith? I don't, I don't know how many of you grew up going to Catholic schools. Um, this is a pretty blessed and fortunate community because most people who live in Auburn, if I may be so brave to say this, but I think it's true from what I've experienced. Most people who live in Auburn are not from Auburn, right? This is, this, this is definitely like, it's a university town that's grown up a lot of people from all over. The Midwest, the Northeast, the West Coast, like people from all over, different nations. It's beautiful. We have a very diverse community. So people come from very different backgrounds. Um, so I don't know what your experience of learning about the faith has been. I grew up, I was very fortunate. I had a really awesome experience with Catholic schools. I learned a lot there. It very much so inspired my heart. Um, to be open to the Lord's call, which is why I'm standing here before you today. Um, and I hope that as we found our new school here this upcoming year, that that continues to be a blessing. It will be a blessing for this community as well. So Catholicism 101 is basically just a breakdown of the most basic principles of the Catholic faith. That doesn't mean it'll be very surface level and simple. We are going to go deep. We're going to talk about some um, pretty awesome things, in my opinion. But the whole idea is in order to celebrate the Catholic faith, in order to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have to give everything to him. And we have to use every gift at our disposal to do that. Not only our bodies, not only our hearts and our emotions and our feelings, not only our money and our time and all that kind of stuff, but entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ is also something we do and is bettered by our intellect. And so the more we understand who God is, the more deeply we can enter into a relationship with him. Now, disclaimer, God is infinite. Which means that even, this is a little, a little foreshadowing of something we'll talk about in a few weeks, even when you die, and hopefully we pray and we work that, um, and we have faith that we will go to heaven, even in heaven, your understanding of God will not be perfectly complete. Like God will still be mysterious, even when you're beholding him in the beatific vision, seeing him face to face, you are perfected, you're in heaven. There will still be depths of mystery to God that we will not know. That's okay. You know, at the end of the day, God is infinite. In order to contain entirely an infinite thing in your mind, in your intellect, in your understanding, you would have to, too, be intellect, uh, infinite. And we're not. We're not infinite. We're finite. We're limited. So the whole idea of Catholicism 101 is to help you guys um, kind of come into deeper understanding of why we do the things we do, which is particularly these first four weeks. So the first four weeks, we're going to be focusing on the Mass. We're going to be focusing on the thing that we do every single Sunday. And the reason we wanted to start here 
is, um, is quite simply because this is the thing we do, right? If you're Catholic, you know you go to church on Sunday. That's like just rule number one. You've got to go to Mass on Sunday. Even if you're on vacation and you're out in another country, you find a Catholic church and you go to Mass on Sunday. That's like rule number one. And we'll explain why that's important and why that's serious. But the f- simple fact of the matter is most of your encounter with the church and most of your encounter with Jesus Christ himself is going to come through the sacrament of the Eucharist and is going to come through your celebration of that sacrament. So the whole idea to start off is why do we do the things we do? We don't always start with intellect, right? If you have children, if you have young children, you've brought them up in the faith. The first thing you do with them is not explain to them, well, this, you know, we believe in transubstantiation, so that's like, no, what you do is you just bring them to Mass. And they start to learn by doing it. And then they start to realize, whoa, 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 this is kind of, we use like really fine things. Like, oh, we don't drink cups like that at home, right? And then they start to learn very naturally just from the images and the symbols. So many of us were not blessed with an understanding of what all those symbols are and why we do the things we do. So that's the reason we're going to start here because that's the beginning of anyone's faith. It's just the encounter of doing it, right? So that's why we're going to start here in the first four weeks. But... In order to talk about the Mass, there's thousands of years of history that comes before it. Jesus Christ did not just show up as the first human being ever to walk the face of the planet, right? He was incarnate in a particular time to a particular people who had a particular understanding, not only of themselves, but of God and the world around them. And so to understand who Jesus was speaking to and why he said the things he did and why he instituted the sacraments the way he did, We have to understand kind of his background. And there's no better place to understand the Jewish people than the book of Exodus. Okay? But before we get there, I want to pull one line out of Genesis to kind of be our starting principle. In the very first chapter of Genesis, I believe the verse is 126. So, verse 26. God says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. The idea is God created man in this process of creation, right? And when he created man, he created us after his own image and likeness. So right from the beginning, the Jewish people understood, from the very beginning of time, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created the trees and the plants and the animals, he created the seas, he created everything we see, everything we know. When God created it, he created man special. There was something different about mankind. And what was different about mankind is they were created in the image and likeness of God himself. They have some kind of divine spark in them. They're they're part creature, right? We are part creature. We are created in this universe. But we're also kind of part divine. There's something about us that that is bigger and more infinite and more special, if you will, than the rest of creation. And I would imagine your experience has ratified that. How many of you have dogs? Raise your hand. How many of you have dogs? I love dogs. Dogs are nothing in comparison to human beings. And I hope you understand that. Dogs do not have intellect. You probably do understand that. Dogs cannot reason, they cannot love the way that we do because they do not have that same spark of the divine in them. Yes, every bit of creation has a fingerprint of the creator in it. But dogs were not created in the image and likeness of God. Especially cats were not created in the image of God. <laughs> Sorry, that's a little bit of my bias. I'm allergic to cats, so it's a total bias thing. But my whole point is humans are special, right? And we have a particular relationship with God because of that. But not only do we have a particular relationship with God, but we also have a particular attraction towards and an affinity towards God. There's something in us that knows that there's something else. There's something in us that knows that this isn't the end. Which is interesting, because if you follow the history of humankind from the very beginning of like the Homo sapiens species, right? What you'll notice is there has always been an innate like religiosity. There's always been this innate desire to offer worship to something invisible. There's always been this understanding there's got to be something more than just what's right here. It just doesn't make sense if there isn't someone controlling the cosmos, right, in a sense. So even from the very beginning, we've had this innate desire in our hearts. We've had this innate draw towards the infinite, towards the divine. And I would venture a guess that the only reason any of you are sitting in here is because in some way, 
whether explicit or implicit, you've experienced that as well. Maybe you've witnessed miracles in your life. Maybe you've seen things happen that you're just like, I don't know. Or maybe you've experienced in yourself. You've, maybe you've had a rock bottom moment. You're just like, I need to get my life in order. And for whatever reason, God reached out to your heart and decided to invite you into relationship. Okay. So where we're going to begin this journey of Catholicism 101, and particularly this journey through the Mass, is we have to understand how it is that we relate to God. If you want to know who you are, you have to understand God himself. And you have to understand how we can relate to him. Because not only were we created from him and kind of in his image, we were also created to return to him. We were always meant to be in communion with God. This whole life has been a meaningful journey to reconnect with our Lord. The whole point of Jesus Christ coming, becoming man, walking around, teaching us, healing us, saving us, dying for us, rising again. All of that has to do with bringing you into further communion with God. That's the whole point. If you thought your life was about anything else than entering into communion with God, you've been sorely mistaken. You've been misled at the very least. So how do we relate to God? There's only one way. There's only one proper relationship that we possess with God. There's only one way for us to truly relate to God, and that is through worship. Worship is the only justified and natural way that creation can honor and enter into relationship with the creator. We are finite. We are limited. Our very existence is purely a mercy on God's part. The fact that you are sitting here and you have being means that God is sustaining you in being. He is holding you. He's suspending you in existence right now. And that's an active thing. It's not like he created you and just let you go off. Like he is actively choosing to keep you around right now. For better or for worse. Right? Everybody. Because he loves you and he knows you. The only way we could possibly relate to a being like that is through worship. It's what's justifi justifiably rendered towards God. We owe everything to him. Everything you have, everything you are comes directly from him. It's a gift. We don't, owe, we don't deserve it. We haven't earned it as much as you would like to believe that you've kind of built your life. Yeah, you've participated in that. But the Lord is who's blessed you. He's the one that's given you everything you have. So worship is really the only way we can truly relate to God. It's the only way we can really enter into union with him. Okay? And that, again, has been a natural impulse of humanity from the very beginning. We see, all, we see paintings in caves. We see kind of stone edifices being created. And everything has been rendered towards the gods in general, this divine essence that we kind of have a natural inclination to. So that brings a really important question. How do we worship? What is worship? Like, how do we actually render good worship to the Lord? Because he's God and we are creation, right? So if we want to relate to God, if we want to be fulfilled in our relationship to him, how do we do that? And I think the answers are contained in the book of Exodus. And that's how the Jews would have understood it as well. They would have read Exodus. Exodus, I like to say, is like the odyssey for the Jewish people. Like this is their central myth. This is their central story. Everything kind of makes sense in the context of this event. If you don't know what the book of Exodus is about, basically the whole book of Exodus is about when God saved the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. Remember the ten plagues that he cast down on Egypt to try to convince Pharaoh to let the people go, Moses, Aaron, etc. And then Exodus continues as they journey through the desert. And then they all of a sudden get to the promised land. So Exodus is a story of salvation. It's a story of, a story of being saved from slavery. It's being the story of being given an identity as a people. So I want to jump. And I want to jump to... Exodus 8. So the people are enslaved in Egypt. Um, and the, basically the way that happens, I'm going to give you the really, really quick, quick notes version of exactly how that happens. Remember, God came down to Abraham and said, I want to choose you. You're going to be a father to many people. You're going to have descendants okay, scattered across the nation. You're going to be my people. You're going to be my portion, you know, and my prize. And so he had a son, and his name was Isaac. And that's when God kind of did the cruel test, if you will, right? He says, okay, I've given you what you wanted in a son in your very old age. Now I want you to sacrifice him to me. 
And Abraham had faith. And so God spared Isaac and he slaughtered a ram instead. So then Isaac had some sons, right? He had Jacob and Esau, not in that order. Jacob became the chosen one. You can read that story. It's fascinating. And then Jacob wrestled with God one night. And so then he got renamed Israel. And now Israel has 12 sons. One of Israel's 12 sons is named Joseph. And his brothers didn't like the fact that Joseph was his father's favorite. So what did they do? They cast him into a hole and sold him into slavery. Joseph ends up in Egypt. Now all of a sudden Joseph climbs the ranks. He becomes a powerful lord in Egypt. He gets, uh, he, um, the Pharaoh gets attracted to him. He's like, hey, this is a really good guy. I want him to be one of my men. But then a famine happens, right? And the Israelites, the, 12, uh, the 11 brothers now, and Israel, they have to come to Egypt to search for food and grain. And so Joseph, that's when Joseph has this great moment of reconciliation. He forgives his brothers for doing that horrible thing to them. Now, all of a sudden, the Israelites are in Egypt. Now, they're living because this famine kind of cast them there. And they have special privilege because one of the sons of Israel, Joseph, is living this wonderful life in Egypt. He's a powerful lord in Egypt. Well, as you know, political regimes change. A new pharaoh comes. And the new pharaoh is like, I don't know you, Joseph. Who are you? Where are you from? So what happens to the people of Israel? They become enslaved. And that's how they end up in slavery in Egypt. If you didn't know that, there's the story. You should read through it. Wonderful story. <clears throat> so now the people are enslaved. They're trapped in this foreign nation. This was never meant to be their place. This was never meant to be their home. But it became so by the accidents of history, by famine and drought. Right? And so the Lord goes, I'm going to save my people. They are not slaves, but they are my portion. And my people live free. So what does he say? So before the second plague, I love, I love this little line because it's very important. You've all heard the like, classic line, right? Moses says, let my people go. Right? That's, like, that's the classic line from the story of Exodus, let my people go. Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, God says, let my people go. But what I think is interesting is we don't like, you know there's more to the line, right? It's not just let my people go. Did you know that? There's more to the line. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, let my people go, comma, so that they may worship me. Hmm. Interesting. Not so that they can go have their own land and live free. Not so that they can go have fun in the desert. Not so that whatever, whatever, fill in the blank. No, let my people go so that they can come and worship me. That's really interesting. Kind of in our modern understanding of freedom and slavery, which is, you know, very present on the mind and consciousness of today. Like, we're not talking about freedom to worship. No, we talk about freedom so that you can live your life however you want. That's not what God means. That's not what God meant when he saved his people. He said, no, let my people go so that they can worship me. Let my people go, in other words, so that they may enter into right relationship with me. You see, these are my people. They live under my dominion. They're under my home. And right now they're enslaved to another's dominion. So I'm going to save them so that they can properly enter under my domain. They can properly enter under my authority. That's the whole point of Exodus. If you've ever wondered why God saved his people, it's because he wanted to save them so that they could offer true worship. So, you know how the story goes. The ten plagues, you know, God's really mad at Pharaoh, and he's like, I'm going to send these horrific events upon the people of Egypt, and I'm going to hope that Pharaoh wisens up. He's going to get a, the idea, it's like, okay, I'm going to let these people go, they're more trouble than they're worth, right? That's the whole point. But the tenth plague is the worst of all. It comes to the tenth plague, and it's very sad. And the tenth plague that God was going to send upon the people of Egypt was... I'm going to send an angel of death over the entire land of Egypt. And the firstborn male of every single family, human and beast alike, even your cattle and your sheep, the firstborn male, all of them are going to be killed. See, what's interesting to me about this plague, though, was this plague was not just like specifically, specifically targeted at the Egyptians. Right? Like, this is God, after all. He can do whatever he wants. And he decides to send it at the tenth plague. But for whatever reason, he doesn't have the ability to like discreetly only harm the Egyptians, right? He's like, no, everyone's going to do it. And Moses is like, what? Why? Aren't we your chosen people? <laughs> right? At least that's what I would have been thinking. Why would you kill us? 
Like, what point does that make? You're just going to kill everybody? So God, obviously, these are his chosen people. But he doesn't just, like, kind of add a little loophole. It's like, okay, angel of death, just don't hurt the Israelites, right? Just skip over their homes. No, what he does is like, okay, fair. This angel of death is coming, and it's going to kill everyone. It's going to kill all the firstborn males. I would have been dead. That would have been me. But God says, you know what? I do have mercy on my people, though, and I want to save them. But I'm not just going to do it. You see what I mean? Like, what he understood very early on, God does, because he's brilliant, and he created us, so he knows how we think. He says, they need to participate in this situation. Because if I just do everything for them, not good. They're going to forget. They're going to get really spoiled. They're going to get entitled, you know. So they need to participate in this act of salvation, this, this act of kind of saving themselves from this angel of death. So what does he do? He tells them to celebrate the Passover meal. He says, the Lord said to Moses, this is Exodus chapter 12, by the way, verse 1, if you're wondering. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. I don't know about you, but that was super specific. <laughs> that was very, very specific. Not just, okay, I want you to eat a lamb one day, you know, and if you get time, you know, if it's convenient for you, I want you to take the blood. I want you to spread it on the door. No, he said, look, every single household needs to eat a lamb. They need to eat the whole thing. And they have to cook it this precise way. And you better be dressed the right way. You gotta be dressed exactly this way. Girds, loins, sandals on your feet, all uh, loins girded, sandals on your feet, staff in hand. That's that's imagery of pilgrimage. The idea is you are eating this meal, but you're eating it as a pilgrim. You're not comfortable in your own home. This is not your home. Egypt is not your place. I have a promised land coming for you. The whole Passover meal was very utterly specific. You have to do it this way. And so now we start to uncover a basic principle of worship. We do not invent worship. Worship is not something we create. It's not something we come up with. Worship is something that God teaches us. Worship is something that God instructs us in. And another principle, maybe even more important, worship can be done inappropriately. Worship can be done wrong. That may be a crazy concept in today's time, but you can worship poorly. You can worship in an incorrect manner. That's an important idea. I want, to, I want us to contain that kind of in our minds. So, Passover happens and they listen diligently. And here's the other thing too. God wasn't like, okay, look. If the timing doesn't work out, for whatever reason you can't find a lamb, it's okay. I'll just, I'll honor it, you know. No, no, no. Look, if you want, if you want your firstborn children to be alive in the morning, you're going to do it. That's it. How serious is this to you? How serious is the life of your firstborn? How serious is the life of your most precious child? Which I totally think is the thing. <laughs> Personally. I mean, let's be honest. <clears throat> How precious is that life to you? I bet you those families found a way to find the land. I'm sure it was very inconvenient for some of them. 
Some of them probably had to spend a lot of money. Some of them probably had to go pretty far. I don't know, but I'm just saying, how worth it is, you, is it to you to save the life of your firstborn child? Yeah, they made the sacrifice and they made it work. Yeah, for some it was probably really easy. They didn't think twice about it. But for some of them it may have been a little more inconvenient. All right, interesting idea. So what happens? Pharaoh is terrified because his firstborn son is killed that night. And so he lets them go, right? And they pass through the, the Red Sea and Pharaoh's chariots are all destroyed. Beautiful. The Lord is fighting for his people. But now, now they're in the desert. I don't know if you've ever been in the desert. But I, don't, I wouldn't like to spend a lot of time out there. There are no plants. There's hardly any water. There's really nothing to do out there. And um, this is really important to remember. The journey from Egypt to the promised land of Cana, um, if you were to walk it, even today, it would probably take about 11 days. That's about, that's about how long it would have taken. Like, and so we add a little extra time. This is a huge caravan of a lot of people walking together. I mean, we'll give them, we'll give them 20 days just to, to be super conservative and generous. All right. The Israelites were in the desert for 40 years. That's a really long amount of time. Why is that? Why did it take 40 years for God to guide his chosen people, his precious people, his really important, most loved people? Why did he take them the most obscenely long route possible? Maybe because the 40 years in the desert was not just about traveling on a highway to their next location. Maybe there was something more important happening in that desert. Remember, let my people go so that they may worship me. Okay. We start to get the first insights of what that looks like. I'm your Lord. If I command something, you do it. That's the basic principle, right? That's the basic principle of relationship with God. I'm smarter than you. I know more things than you. You're a, little imp, you're a little finite human being. You live 100 days. It's like about the best any of us get, if you're lucky, right? What do you know? I'm God. I created the universe. I created this whole gamut. I created you, after all. What do you know? So you listen to me. You follow my rules, and you'll be okay. So he goes into the desert. And there's a couple of events that happen, right? The people start complaining. They're hungry, so God sends them bread, rains down from heaven. And that happened every day for 40 years while they were in the desert. They said, well, we want to eat meat, too. Super pretentious request, in my opinion. Very, uh, very entitled of them. But you know what? The Lord is merciful, and he loves his people. So he sent them quail every morning, and they would go and just pick them up and eat. It's like, okay, that's a cool deal. And then they were thirsty. There's not much water in the desert. So what did God do? He's like, okay, just hit that rock or something. I don't know. Hit the rock. So he hit the rock, and water came out of it, because God can do that. So now we get to where I think is probably the most important moment in the entirety of the Hebrew people, in the entirety of the Israelites, the Jews, right? Um, besides the coming of Jesus Christ, but some of them miss that. So <clears throat> they finally come to this mountain, and the mountain is called Mount Sinai. You've probably heard of Mount Sinai. I want to read from you when they arrive at Mount Sinai. So they arrive there, and then three days later, this is what it says. This is Exodus 19, by the way. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning, as well as a thick cloud on the mountains, and a blast of a trumpet so loud that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. The smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln, while the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses would speak, and God would answer him in thunder. When the Lord descended upon Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. So right now, <clears throat> I hope you get this image of when they show up to Mount Sinai that's terrifying. 
God, I've just seen what God can do when he's a little angry. You know, he turned the river into blood. He sent like all these insects and pestilence upon the people of Egypt. He ultimately went and murdered every firstborn child, animal and beast alike in the kingdom of Egypt. I do not want to be on this dude's bad side, right? He ultimately opened the sea for us to walk through and then caused the sea to come back and destroy Pharaoh's armies, which the chariots in Pharaoh's armies would have been considered the most powerful army in the world at that time. It's like, hmm, this guy means business. And so now they're walking up to this mountain and there's lightning and thunder and a thick cloud around the mountain. And God is speaking in thunderclaps, right? It's just like this crazy, scary moment. What I love is when they were going to approach, Moses had to bring, Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. What's interesting, we pick up another principle of worship here. God needed to take his people out of Egypt into the wilderness in order to go worship God, which is interesting. Worship is not something you do in your home. Not principally. Worship is something you go into the wilderness to do. Worship is not something you do in the comfort of your camp. Worship is something you have to leave your camp to go do. Worship, in other words, is not something that just happens in your own space. But worship requires you to step out of your comfort zone. It requires you to step out of what is familiar and step into something new, something uncomfortable, something desolate. You have to kind of leave the world behind. You have to leave your old self behind and enter into a new space. After all, in the old days, um, you know the white garment for baptism? There's a a particular blessing for the white garment, and we always wear white, you know, when we get baptized. Um, In the the earliest days of the church, when they're just bringing people in, what they would do is, um, and also remember there's a renunciation, right? I renounce Satan and all his evil works and all his evil promises, right, all that stuff. And you say, and I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. What you would have to do is you would stand outside the church and you would face west. It's not west, I get it, but for our purposes, east was over by the tabernacle, right? They would stand outside the church and they would look west, which is why churches were always built facing east, just for the record. So they were facing west, the, 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 the direction of the setting sun, the direction of darkness. And they would say, I renounce Satan renounce Satan in that direction. And then they would take all their clothes off. They'd be butt naked. Y'all are now really thankful that Joe got baptized as infants. <clears throat> and then they would come into the church. And then they would face east. They would face the direction of the rising sun. The direction of our risen Lord. Right? They would face east and they would say, I believe in God, the Father, and the maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, etc., etc. But then they would put a white garment on. And the whole idea of that, the whole symbolism of that point, is that you have to throw the old self out. When you were born, you belonged to Satan. If you're born into this world, you belong to sin. You belong to his dominion. You belong to his domain. So you have to face him. You have to renounce him. You have to throw all your old clothes off. And then you have to step into the people of God. You have to step into the body of Christ. And then you have to accept the world. You have to accept this new life. Same kind of image is what's happening here in Exodus. If you're going to go confront the Lord, you have to leave the old stuff behind. You have to leave it behind, right? So they come up to the they come up to God, and they're just, just thundering up on the mountain, terrifying. You also have to remember this is very important. I'll pick up where I left off. Verse twenty-one. Then the Lord said to Moses. Go down and warn the people not to break through to the Lord to look. Otherwise, many of them will perish. You see, the Jewish understanding of God was that if I look on the face of God, I'll immediately die. I literally will be just struck dead. God is so perfect. He's so big. He's so powerful. He's so incredible that me and my imperfection and my lowliness, if I were to look at God face to face, As a sign of equality, right, looking face to face, hmm, I would die immediately. I literally, my being could not contain beholding God's face. You know, when when God appears to many people in the Old Testament, like Moses, for example, when he appears, they immediately shield their face. Because their understanding is, if I look God face to face, I'm dead. 
I don't want that to happen. But that, so that's what God's saying. It's like, look, 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 don't let anybody just come up on this mountain. You see, because if they come up on this mountain and look at me face to face, they're probably going to die. They can't contain it. They're, they're not in the right space. They're not perfect. They haven't been chosen to come to this. So now you get another principle of worship. You have this mountain imagery, right? There's a reason our sanctuary, by the way, I'm kind of getting a little ahead of myself, but there's a reason the sanctuary is up steps. There's a reason it's not all on the same level as you. It's not because I think I'm better than you guys, or it's not also because I want you guys to see me. That's not it at all. <clears throat> the reason it's up steps like that is because it's a symbol. It's a symbol of going up the mountain. Because the idea is in the ancient days, like mountains are where you go to encounter gods, right? Like Mount Olympus, for example. Right? The idea is like gods live on mountains because mountains go up into the sky and that's where gods are. Gods are up in the sky. So whenever they would encounter God, they would almost always do it on a mountain. Remember Jesus' transfiguration. Where does it happen? It happens on a mountain. He goes up a mountain to be transfigured in his divine image. Where does Jesus die? He dies on a little hill, on a little mountain. You see? So everything is about this mountain imagery because you go up the mountain to approach God. The idea is approaching God is something that you don't do lightly. There's a great risk to approaching God. There's an incredible risk to our own life and to our own self being. We don't just walk up the mountain willy-nilly like it's our best buddy up there. You see what I mean? This is God, after all. He's the creator. He's the one that we worship. So what you start to see, too, is approaching God is something we do with fear and trembling. That's why one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we celebrated confirmation yesterday, one of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit is fear and awe of the Lord, wonder and awe of the Lord, right? It's this idea, it's like fear of the Lord. And they talk about that a lot in the Old Testament. I don't know if you realize that, fear of the Lord, fear of the Lord. It's not because we want to be afraid of him, but if you don't have a proper understanding of the risk involved in entering into a relationship with God, you don't know what you're doing, and you're going to get yourself killed, right? So dangerous. It's dangerous to enter into a relationship with God and to go up the mountain. But then, what happens? God says, let my people enter the desert so that they can worship me. But then all of a sudden, and I don't know if you've ever read through the book of Exodus, there's about 12 chapters in here, which would put you to sleep. It starts with chapter 20, um, with the Ten Commandments. And then the next time we're not talking about a rule or a law is chapter 32. It's 12 chapters of straight law. It's 12 chapters of just straight rules about how I want you to live. We haven't even talked about worship yet. God hasn't. And we're already getting like, okay, this is what I want you to do. This is exactly how I want you to do it. This is how you need to live your life. Listen to your parents, right? You need to do this. Don't murder people. Don't, don't be having sex with everybody. You know, you got to live in a right way. So the Ten Commandments and then 12 chapters more of rules coming after. Why is that? He didn't say, let my people into the desert so I can tell them how to live a good life. Or did he? Did he not? He said, let my people go so that they can come into the wilderness and worship me. And if worship is the proper way to enter into relationship with God, if worship is the only proper way we enter into relationship with God, then how to worship has a direct impact on how we live our lives. How we worship is about being in right relationship with God. You know, St. Paul talks, he uses that word a lot. He uses the word righteousness, right? Entering into righteousness. But what Paul is talking about is this concept of right relationship. How do I enter into correct relationship with God? And so the first thing God needs to do is like, if you want to be my chosen people and be in relationship with me, you have to start living your life correctly. So I'm going to give you rules. I'm not giving you rules because I want to restrict your freedom. I want to give you rules to set you free. If you want to know how to be in a relationship with me, this is exactly how. Follow these rules and you'll be good. And we'll be on a good place, right? So 12 chapters of rules. 12 chapters of just rules. <laughs> then <clears throat> we get to the golden calf incident. I don't know if you knew that. They're still at Mount Sinai. Twelve chapters later, still at Mount Sinai. God's still giving him rules. But now, Moses is up on the mountain, which is interesting, right? God only speaks to his chosen person. And he says, I want you to go tell people. Have you noticed that? Is that not kind of weird? 
In the Old Testament, right, he speaks to a prophet. He says, you prophet, I want you to go speak and I want you to tell everybody what I said. Wouldn't it be just much easier if he just held like court like this and just told everybody? It's like now I have to trust that Moses is telling me the truth. You know what I mean? Like Moses could edit the whatever, you know, Nathan, Samuel, all the prophets in the Old Testament, Elijah, Israel, um, Isaiah. Um, it's like I, they can just make up what they're saying. But for whatever reason, God decides only one person gets to come up the mountain and speak to me face to face, which is interesting. Just think about it. Even at mass, only one person goes up that mountain. And they speak to God face to face. And then they come down and present to you what they've found. Interesting. The whole idea is God loves to use mediators. Remember, we only get to the Father through the Son. We only get to the Son through the Holy Spirit. Right? So the idea is mediation is an important aspect of God's relationship too. He doesn't just appear to you face to face. You could die after all, remember? So I'm going to use mediators so that you can understand. You can come into relationship with me. <clears throat> all right. But Moses spent a lot of time up that mountain. And the people of Israel started to get really concerned about that. So it says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, come, make gods for us. You just heard the Ten Commandments 12 chapters ago. You should be like, oh no, that's not good. <laughs> come, make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this, Moses the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. We do not know what has become of him. We don't know. He's been gone forever. We have no idea what's happened to him. He's our mediator between God. We need a new mediator. Not a good idea. Aaron said to them, take off the gold rings that are on, your e on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. So, <clears throat> the most common way this story is interpreted is that this story is a story of idolatry. Oh, those Israelites, those sons of guns, they worshipped the wrong God. That's a big no-no. Can't do that. But here's the thing. If you read this story closely, I'm not so sure that's really what happened. Listen. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I don't think the people of Israel got in trouble with God, which they will in a few moments. <clears throat> I don't think they got in trouble with God because they worshipped the wrong God. They thought they were worshiping the right God, right? Like, th these, these are the gods, right? This is the God who brought you out of Israel. And after all, what did Aaron say? Tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord, the God of gods. So in a sense, the Israelites are trying to worship God. They're trying to offer worship to the God who saved them. The problem is not that they were trying to worship God or that they worshiped a different God. The problem is they worshiped God in the wrong way way they made their own image and God was very strict you do not make images of me you do not know what I look like you cannot behold my face you cannot capture me in an image you see they worshiped the wrong way because let me return to this idea worship is not something we create it's not something we invent God has to instruct us in how to worship because we are incapable of understanding how to give God what he desires. We're too small. We're too limited. Our creativity is not vast enough. The Lord teaches us how to worship. What happens here in the golden calf is God gets mad at his people. He's like, who do you think you are? Creating images and creating rituals. You just created a feast day. Who told you to do that? You can't make your own feast day. 
I tell you when you celebrate. I tell you when you mourn. I tell you when that stuff happens, right? I look, I appreciate the effort. I appreciate you're trying to worship me, but man, you really got off. You really got off on the wrong track if you think you can just create worship. That's what God got mad about. And so they got in trouble. They just he destroyed the Ten Commandments, which is interesting. Interesting image. It's like we worship incorrect. What happens? The law is completely gone. I had this rule of life for you, but you know what? I have to destroy it now because you obviously don't get it. You can't worship right. You can't obey the most basic commandments. All of our law is gone. That's the idea. So he has to go right out the mountain again and beg for mercy. And he has to get a new set of tablets. And he comes out, okay, the Lord's going to give you another shot because he loves you and he's merciful. What does all this mean? Worship, <clears throat> guys, is not something we create. Worship is something that is a gift and an invitation from God. We go up the mountain. We do not pull God down to us. What was the crime of the Israelites in the golden calf incident? They got insecure with the mystery. They got insecure with the fact that they didn't know where Moses was. Gosh, he's taking a really long time. We need to worship God. We need to hear from God. We need to talk to him. Let's, I don't know, let's create a way to experience him. No, that's not how it works. God speaks to you when he wants to speak to you. And that's it. When he has an idea for you to have, when he has a call to place in your heart, he'll do it when he wants, right? God does not speak to us just because we want to talk to him. It's like we, we are living our entire lives on God's time. We are living our entire lives when God, in the way God decides to do it. When he's ready for us to go, he will take us. I promise you that. And I know many of you have experienced that in your life. God's timing is not our timing. And oftentimes it's very inconvenient. I'll just go ahead and tell you that. Right? Here's the next thing. <clears throat> One of the most beautiful images, I think, in this Exodus is um, God kind of guides his people through the desert. And the way he does it is he, at nighttime, he appears as a pillar of fire. And he just kind of like hovers over the people and guides them. But he also, during the day, appears as a pillar of cloud. And I think that's a really interesting idea. Because what is fire? Fire is light, right? Fire casts light on everything. In the light of fire, we can see through the darkness. And anytime you hear light and darkness, you not only think of good and evil, but you also think of knowing and unknowing. So not only that, but fire kind of enlightens us. So what we learn is God is a pillar of fire. God is a pillar of knowledge. He's a, he's a pillar of understanding. In the fire, in the light of God, we truly make sense. God enlightens our mind. He enlightens our hearts. So when we are in right relationship with him, everything makes sense, right? We just understand not only ourselves, but the way we relate to everyone else. We understand the way to relate to the world. We understand how to relate to God even. But God isn't just a fire. He's also a cloud. And clouds have the opposite effect. I don't know if you've ever driven through really heavy mist and fog. But it's very hard to see. It's very shrouding. So what we learn, too, is there's also mystery to God. He enlightens us. But I'm telling you right now, the more you learn and the more you dive into relationship with God, the more you'll realize, gosh, I really don't know anything. He still surprises he still sneaks up on us. He still catches up us off guard. There's always deeper to go in relationship with God. There's always more to God. Which is what returns us to our original point, guys. Even in heaven, when you're holding what we call the beatific vision, and we'll talk more about that in one of the later sessions um, in Catholicism 101. But the idea is when you're in heaven, you're beholding God face to face. Which, think about it. Think about what the Jews understood that would have meant. That would have meant death. But only in heaven, when you've become perfected, can you finally behold God face to face. No mystery, no shroud, right? No sacramental signs, but just directly, essence to essence, right? Even then, there will still be mystery. There will still be depths to him that we don't get. And that's kind of part of the beauty of God. Nothing you experience is beyond him. Nothing you experience is new to him. There isn't anything in your life that, like, catches God off, off, uh, off guard. Right. 
Everything is contained in him. He understands. He understands what you experience and everything you go through. So, my challenge in kind of this opening talk is to understand the basics of worship. Number one, worship is not something we create. It's something that is given to us by God. It is something we are instructed in. Number two, worship requires a particular way of life. Worship always comes with it a life, a code of life, a code of living, a morality, a certain law. In order to be in right relationship with God, we have to be in right relationship with him in our entire lives. It's not enough that we worship him correctly on one day. We have to worship him correctly in everything we do. Right? Then all the images, the mountains, we go up to meet God. We do not pull God down to our level. He's always bringing us up into himself. Right? There's a lot. But here's a question. After today, I hope and I pray that the question on your mind and heart is, where can perfect worship be found? Where is the best worship? Where is the worship that God has given us? Where is the worship that God has instructed us in? Where is the worship where I can walk confidently into that space and know that God is being rendered perfect worship, appropriate worship, right worship? You can come back later and find out. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of today, and thank you, Lord, for the gift of this time which we have shared. I ask, Lord, that our minds and our hearts may be opened ever more deeply to your presence, that we may come to know you ever more perfectly. Lord, continue to bless us and keep us safe. Watch over us and our family members. Watch over all those who suffer. And we bring these prayers and these offerings to you, Lord through the intercession of our Blessed Virgin Mother, through the intercession of Joseph, her spouse, and through the intercession of St. Michael the Archangel, our patron saint. And we offer these as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Lord be with you. And with your spirit. The Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. All right. Have a great day.